Thank you all for being here. It's good to see your bright and shiny faces. There's a bunch of you. Uh, my name is Peter and I'm hosting our fourth virtual reading. I can't believe that it's our fourth one already and who would have thought this would last so long that we're gonna have four and we have uh, more coming up. So hang in there. Anyway, this isn't quite the same as um, a reading in person, but I found in some ways it's a lot more intimate. When we were uh, listening last week to our three readers, I felt uh, by looking at them in the screen, they were talking to me. It was really something, a new experience for me. I'd like to thank uh, my Murphy writing colleagues, Stephanie Cawley and Tella Coyle, who've arranged this and our other programs. And I'd also like to thank our three readers tonight, Joe Kisnall, Kat Doty, and Tom McAllister. You can read their bios on the Murphy Writing event page on Facebook, so this way I don't have to pick up your time. And next week, we're going to focus, uh, our three readers will be Christine Salvatore, Robbie Clipper, and uh, Gretna Wilkinson. And if you'd like to see our previous readings from the last three weeks, or would like to re-experience them, go to YouTube and pop in Murphy Writing and our page will come up. And Stephanie will also post the uh, link to that on the chat box on the right, so you can, you can uh, copy it there. I'm sorry to say that because of Zoom bombing, that other virus, we've had to turn off the chat for this reading so that this way we're not invaded. Uh, and if you're not familiar, the other things that we're doing, each uh, day, Monday to Friday, we have uh, a program where you get a writing prompt and you have an opportunity to uh, share that on Canvas. If you go to murphywriting.com, you can sign up for that if you haven't already. The uh, writing prompt is good for uh, writing prose, poetry, or something in between. You can use it to start a new piece or use it to develop something already in progress. The next one will be this Monday at four, and we also do them Wednesday nights at seven and Fridays at noon. Uh, we hope that you do that. And um, one more announcement. Uh, we have opened up um, some online workshops on Wednesday um, and they're filling up very quickly. In fact, I'll be leading a memoir workshop that is already filled and Stephanie is leading a poetry workshop that has just a few spots in it. So if you're interested, please go to mercywriting.com and sign up right away. In addition, we'll also be offering uh, tutorials in poetry and prose. And uh, finally, before we get started, I'd like to suggest you turn on your camera so that um, our readers can see your face and uh, it's just like, um, you know, in a real reading, or not a real, this is a real reading, but an in-person reading. And at the bottom of your Zoom page, there's um, a reaction button, you see that? And you can clap. So you can clap or put a thumbs up if you wanna do that, you can do that during the reading. Okay, so at this time, let me welcome uh, our readers, and they're going to read in order, Joe Castell, Kat Doty, and Tom McAllister. So please welcome Joe. Oh, hi. Thank you so much, Peter and uh, Stephanie and Taylor and Murphy Writing, Stockton University. I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, it's really, really great. So thank you guys so much to uh, Tom and Kat for reading with me and to all you cool cats and kittens out there who joined us tonight. Really, really appreciate it. Um, I have uh, really been using this quarantine to get in touch with me, you know, to write digital, uh, diligently and learn about this guy up here. No, I haven't. I've been stress eating and yelling at my kids and binge watching Netflix. So um, though before quarantine, I wrote this story that um, has, doesn't have a home yet, but I'm going to read. I'll probably get to read about half of it tonight. So um, I just finished it. Um, the character came to me a long time ago with a problem, but I couldn't figure out how to fix it for him. Um, and I just recently did. So I'm going to read something brand new tonight. This is called Till It Pops. And I'm not at the beginning of the story, which would probably help. Okay, here we go. Till it pops. There was no doubt about it now. Today, Stuart Douglas Bannister's head was going to pop off his body. Not metaphorically, but actually. A real event. An occurrence, if you will. It might pop like a champagne cork, Stu told his own eyes reflected in the rearview mirror. Might go up like a rocket. Just not as powerful, of course. Though... Truth be told, there's no real way of knowing how powerful the pop will be. It might be a nuclear blast. Could be gentle as a dandelion off the stem. That's the thing. You just don't know till it pops. Stu was rehearsing. And this is, as they say, Allison, that. And then, Stu didn't know. Might his daughter cry? Well, that's the last thing Stu wanted. And he'd tell her so. But even as he thought it, Stu could feel a smile tingle in the slack of his cheeks. Might she yell? Probably. Allison always was an emotional child. Stu killed the engine, 
and the pre-dawn cold froze his window shield opaque. Nothing stirred the soft blackness of Allison Street. No doubt this was going to piss her off, his showing up so early, but what choice did he have? This is urgent, and Stu had to be 100% sure Allison would even be home. Besides, he couldn't sleep anymore. He hadn't slept in months. How can a man sleep when his own head is a time bomb? When things calmed down and Allison served them both coffee, maybe Danish, his daughter would ask about his arrangements. I don't want you to worry, Dove. By then, Stu'd be using his old pet names. I tied it all up. And yes, fill her up. I don't say no to much these days. You know, since I found out, there's been more coffee, more sugar, more everything. You know, before I never even ate breakfast. Now my mornings are pork rolls and hot showers. My whole life, I took the same showers I took in the service, cold and quick. No more. I take my time. I let the water hit me all over. These new feelings, this spring and stew step, conjured fantasies, made him dream of leaving the world and his own head in grand style. The pop aimed at some significant spot, like the courtyard at Independence Hall, or better yet, at the Liberty Bell itself. He imagined the blood splattering off the cast iron in declaration, maybe on the center ice at the Flyers, or maybe something subtler. He could aim the pop at a couple of UPenn co-eds, leaving a center city Chipotle. But you know, Dove, in the end, drama's not my style. Truth is, a head popping's no one's business, just a man in his head. It's my problem, my fate, and that's why I can't have you worrying. Now, now, Dove, don't start with all this crying again. Then Stu might slide closer to his daughter, maybe even hug her. That would be nice. It's been so long. My head will probably pop against my headboard in the bedroom, he'll tell her, maybe sometime late tonight or early tomorrow. That's how the popping should be. It's for the best. Allison might think differently, Stu rationalized. Maybe she'd want him to stay with her, let his head pop off around family. The only family is left, really. He'd decline, of course. Today, his head would pop off. So what? Who cares? People die every day. Unless, of course, Allison insisted. Then the sun appeared through Allison's, though Allison's street gave no reaction. Stu waited for a sign of life to make his move. Finally, a newspaper man crept by in an old Plymouth. An ear-butted woman in fleece and head wrap jogged out her front door. An old lady dragged a shih tzu down narrow stairs and walked it in circles in front of her own home. When the dog shat, she produced a floral bag for the excrement. The pair stopped across the street from Stu's car and stared at him with wet eyes. Stu was going to smile and wave so they didn't get suspicious, but suddenly they looked frightened. Then together they turned and ran. Before he could wonder why, Stu felt the cold of the door opening beside him. He freaked and grabbed at strong hands that crumpled his collar. The hands entered the cab of his car like apparitions, and Stu was on the street before he knew it. In a breathless twirl, he was pinned hard against his own car, his neck snapping back against the roof. He wondered if the popping might happen right here but it didn't. He should be so lucky. As Stu recovered focus, he recognized his attacker. The man's face twisted in a scowl. His suit jacket, silver with a faint pinstripe, rose up his torso. Stu had only seen this man in pictures on the Facebook, never in person and never in so much anger. Does she know you're here? The attacker asked. Nagi. Wait, Stu said. Nope, not my name. Naj. Naji, right? Naji, Naji, and you didn't answer my question. I'm Al's father, Stu, Stuart Bannister. Oh, I know who you are, and don't call her Al, okay? Stu didn't expect that. I call her Al, not you. Naji spat venom at him. Stu could feel it heating up his cold face. You call her Allison, or better yet, call her nothing. Call her on the phone from whatever hole you crawled out of. And with that, Naji let Stu go. What is, coming, what is coming here going to prove, Mr. Bannister? What could you possibly have to say to her? Because she has nothing to say to you. Students, students stop to let Najee's words sink in. Now you listen to me. Get out of here. No, I don't know how you people are raised, but Najee's face went slack. Stu knew he had said something wrong immediately, but it only made his ultimate point more important, so he could not stop talking. If Stu had time to think, then it might go better. You owe me respect, goddammit. Maybe I don't deserve it as a father to you, well, okay. But the respect of an elder and a United States veteran, I served this goddamn country for you people. 
As Stu spoke, Najee, wide-eyed and fish-mouthed, whispered the word no under his breath. I have every right to see my daughter. Stu tried to sound undaunted, intimidating. He unrumpled himself and straightened his cap. Who the hell are you to tell me what I can or can't do for my own daughter? And I will call her whatever I want to call her. I called her that since she was born. Shoot, I named her that. No. After a series of almost inaudible no's, a final one shot from Najee's mouth like a test firework. No. The force of the word startled Stu back, flinching, pressing his body into his own car, sputtering visible breaths like a wounded dragon. But Najee didn't get any closer. He only pounded his tasseled brown dress shoe against the asphalt, clenched both fists and laughed. God, please help this man who called me you people twice. I meant young people, Nobby. Young people, not the blacks. The blacks. Najee laughed harder. The blacks. Right. Not the blacks. Young people. Much worse. I'm not racist, Nari, though I know you think I am. Stu knew Najee was mocking him, so he talked faster and more. Young people. Young people are crazy, and that's what I meant. I love it. You. Najee pointed a long finger at Stu, and though no one shared the street with the men, he raised his arms again as if presenting Stu as the grand prize on a daytime game show, as if a studio audience or 10 studio audiences surrounded them on the quiet cul-de-sac. You, my father-in-law, Mr. Bannister, you are as advertised. You hear me? As advertised. Stu still worried Najee might hurt him. You, you are one thing and only one thing to me. And that's the one thing you did right. Najee's voice strained as if talking through static. You made that exquisite creature in there that I call my wife. And that and that alone is why you will keep standing here outside of my house. With that, Najee backed up, circled around Stu's car, and walked back up his driveway. When I come back out here to go to work, you're going to be gone. Hear me? Najee didn't look back. Allison's not here anyway. So go. Stu's heart raced. The stress could not be good for his head popping. He worked for each breath, still a bit crumpled and coughing against his car door. He watched Najee framed in reds and yellows of the new sunlight. Stu was so mad he could spit at how ungrateful young people are today. This is what happens, you know, when there are no wars. Young men become spoiled, entitled, the whole lot of them. The thoughts moved Stu to action. He stood upright gulped air, and was about to yell at the house at Najee when Allison stepped out of her front door. Allison was grown, professional, put together, not the little girl of his mind's eye. And Stu realized all at once and a bit too late that when he dreamed of talking to his daughter, he imagined a child. But the person before him was no child. She was a woman, enough that it pierced the yards between them, her eyes enough to shrink Stu down, look him back into his car and away, far away and forever. But the pop, Stu reminded himself, the pop is tonight. Allison stepped down the widening concrete semicircles that anchored her front door. She stepped in front of her husband. Stu hadn't noticed, but Najee gestured and emoted like a carnival barker. Allison stepped in front of her husband and placed one hand on his shoulder. And that hand froze Najee as if with soft magic. And the husband dropped his head, his shoulders, and gave a paralyzed nod as his wife passed him towards Stu, who felt every clop of Allison's shoes against the stone, felt each of her footfalls in his heart. She had her mother's gait long and purposed. Her hands shoved into her pockets. Allison lifted her torso stiffly, but she swung her legs casually. She didn't look at Stu until the last possible moment. Hi, Al, Stu said. It's real nice to see you. Allison stared at Stu without a word, panicked by the silence. He spit it all out. Nothing rehearsed, but also everything. The pop, the end, his head. Yes, he missed her wedding, her calls countless Christmases, days turned into weeks and months and years, but his head, his head, his head. What did any of that matter now? Stu was a goner. Surely she could see that. Gone like helium balloons on an open car window. Gone like ice cream cake left on a kitchen counter, a puddle of goo to be scraped off. By the end, Stu wasn't sure what he had said, except that he could hear himself panting for breath. Allison showed him only the top of her head the entire time, her, her hands still in the pockets of a flowing knit sweater she wore over a business suit. She rocked back and forth, her eyes fixed on her pumps. When she finally raised her head, her eyes were expressionless. 
A whole minute passed before Allison spoke. Okay, Dad, she said. What would you like me to do about it? And that's how Allison Johnson finds herself on the way to the Philadelphia Zoo in the car of her estranged father. Najee drives behind them. He's also missing work because he insists, because he knows better than to trust his wife to guard herself, because he loves her. Allison watches Najee in the passenger side mirror, half annoyed, full worry. She stays locked on her husband's face to, to avoid looking at her father. Al, Stu sounds about to launch into a speech. Dad, Allison cuts him off. It's February. Zoos don't open in February. And even if they do, it's Tuesday. Zoos definitely don't open on Tuesdays in February. And uh, with that little nugget, I will end this story. Um, there's nowhere to finish reading it right now because I'm still looking for a home. But um, you can go to jocostyle.com if you would like to read other short stories I've written, um, including the one for which I'm uh, nominated for the Pushkar Prize this year, which was published by Glassworks. This was super fun. I'm going to go back and stare into the abyss. So thank you. Steph, I'll turn it back to you. me, which I think always makes writers look so authentically authory. Um, but then you'd see my uh, most of thing, most of what's down there is cookbooks and one copy of Everybody Poops, and I wouldn't want you to judge me. So this um, first poem, oh, this is a this is a book coming out in January from Cavan Carey Press called One Dorama, and I'm not going to read tonight from my first book, Momentum, but here's the, here's the title poem of my new book, Wonderama. She may have been barely four, but already she knew that the people she watched on TV could see her too, and the smiling man she wanted for herself she shared with a million kids around the world. But she alone saw past the corny songs, the snapping suspenders, to the lonely soul who needed a little girl. Many days as she got dressed in the living room, she'd look up quick from the sock she was pulling on and catch him staring directly into her face. And once he swung a pointed finger at her, a sharp jab that made her hop behind a chair then come out again, one baby step at a time, to summon his eyes again, to see if he missed her. And this is called J.C. and Me in the Summer of 64. Catholicism and puberty duped it out the summer my body broke out of its corral and galloped Patterson's streets in search of sugar through the new and luscious grasses of impure thought. The priest I confessed to dismissed me as overly scrupulous. I was thinking too much about thinking of dirty things. And distracted because the word scrupulous started with screw, I left with a head full of sin and two holy cards, which he passed me as if they were discards in holy strip poker a game I imagined both entertained and instructed. The first was Saint Agatha, Sicily's virgin martyr. Her eyes rolled up to God as often mine were. She would not renounce him despite the terrible tortures he could, being God, have simply plucked her from. If it were me, I'd have just said, Jesus who? Then cantered right out of there with my virgin self and ducked behind the bleachers at Hinchliff Stadium. The second holy card was Jesus himself, bathed in a golden light and softly smiling, halo tipped back and eyes beaming mercy and mirth. I hadn't noticed till then how handsome he was. Eyes like blue poppies, a nose I regarded with envy, wavy auburn hair with a center part. 
I pictured the halls of St. Joe's full of boys and caftans, and me with my black hair tossing in the hot pink short shorts that got me suspended from school. Imagine, I thought, when he too was confused and changing, not quite a man yet, and almost, but not quite, God. Hear me calling his name, though he's already heading towards me, the August wind blowing his robe between his legs, the power to miracle lighting his holy face, a gingery fuzz on his lip, and an eager smile telling me I have powers too. At my nearness, his thoughts will cleave the Patterson Falls, send beer cans and tires bouncing down McBride, and cause the all the way hot dogs at Libby's lunch to vault like angels from their very secret sauce. This is called Grandma. Mischief made her lift her arms and turn with such a look of wonder on her face that I was not afraid to see the flames licking along both sleeves of her flannel robe, but stepped back as one does from an act of God, the better to take in her glittering pale green eyes, her pirate's nose, the few yellow teeth in her little open mouth, as my mother, her own mouth open in a scream, rushed up behind her to yank off the blazing robe and dance on its burning. And Grandma, naked, jubilant, winked at me while the kettle shrieked its way to boiling dry and sent me from some far hilltop in her far world a vision of what it was likely I'd become, wild-eyed and crazy and blazing like a six-gun nothing at all to be met with shame or fear. So this is for her, who now has long been Ash, a chronicle, the last word of which is, oh. And I'm going to end with um, three Franny poems. Um, I write, now it seems, uh, poems for Franny, who um, moved upstairs for me when I was young and um, I got to show her around Patterson. So this is called New Girl in Town. Cross the street, Franny, if ever you spy Joe Mo, whose hand-hewn tar paper shack we approach on bets or pitch chunks of pudding stone at from moving cars. <clears throat> You'll want, too, to skirt Donna's uncles, drunk and jolly, who'll sneak through your screen door with snow cones and try to kiss you, and Ronnie V, who just got out of Rahway. We're not supposed to know what got him there. And St. Ag School is an iron maiden of dangers, though statues of saints peer out of each dusky corner and Jesus, his plaster self, tops the entrance stairs, where one day he stared at a second grader's vomit, hand held before his exposed and flaming heart, as if to express distaste for incarnation. Expect more shame to be handed out than blessings, administered lavishly both in word and deed. For girls, 18 inches of steel on open palms. For boys, once slung across a nun's black lap, lusty wax on the seats of their regulation pants. So that's about it, Fran. Except for that candy store, where the old guy gives out wax lips for Halloween and ends of cold cuts to the dogs he lets inside. He'll say, Sweetheart, you look pale. Are you on the rag? If you're hungry, Franny, tell him yes. He'll put his hand on your stomach and then on your forehead, then tell you you're clammy, then toast you a piece of toast. <clears throat> this is called Hitter. 
We pick the gravel out of the fallen pears and eat them with Wonder Bread and squirts of ketchup, which, Franny, you learn to do because of me, just like you learn to embroider and draw a horse. And what do I learn from you? To avoid your father, to not expect a hot dog when he cooks out, and no offense, but I can't eat your mom's macaroni. It's served in the dishpan she uses to shave her legs. <laughs> and when one day I share with you just what I think of your brother, who you say yourself is as smart as a carnival goldfish, you tell me my mother is old and my nose is big. Then punch me in my big nose and turn and run. So I grab my baseball bat and chase you home kick open your front door the second you slam it, and there sits your father composing a mayonnaise sandwich and not too happy to find me dropping in. He hollers, hey, where are you going with that damn bat? And real fast I answer, oh, Franny asked for it, which if you're honest, you have to admit is funny. Then I whack you in your pink curlers and run like hell. And this, this last one is called Condemned, and it's in three parts. Um, okay, three parts. My friend Lisa Rhodes once said, this is in three parts, and I will signal, you know, when we change parts by, by belching. She said, how do you do it when you're reading? But anyway, Condemned. One, Franny and I leave school with Debbie Nank who's heard about Franny's house and wants to see it, and maybe step inside if she has the nerve. But because it's Friday, and Friday means craft macaroni, Franny runs the steep last block alone. Debbie freezes when we reach Franny's slumping porch, the house with its caving roof and glassless windows. She confides in me that if that's where she had to live, she'd race to the footbridge and hurl herself into the falls. Then she asks me, where do I live? Which is downstairs from Franny. Two, before waddling off to snooze in the dark all day, our mother's possum peeks out from his hole in the wall, one seated each evening with berries and cold spaghetti and night crawlers pried from the ground with a carving fork. In volume O of A Neighbor's Funk and Wagnalls, in dawn's primal light with coffee and some despair, she learns that the only marsupial in our country, not to mention the first one ever to live in her kitchen, belongs to the least evolved of all the species. Like her, for millions of years, he hasn't changed. But for now, she takes solace in her possum's opposable thumbs, the phalanx of fangs he bears in a pink-tongued yawn. Soon her children will waken and plague her with their needs. Three. While Peggy draws John Lennon on the wall, I print in magic marker on the ceiling a poem I love about poppies and the dead. Mary cracks black walnuts with a rock and feeds the pieces to our sister Judy, who pries the rusted lid from a can of house paint so she and Tommy can camouflage their beds. In the kitchen, our happy mother plays Nelson Eddy, so loud that it drowns out the screams of the couple upstairs. She is the reason, she tells us, why we are so smart. And smarts you can't buy, or we'd sell ours and get a TV. And um, I want to thank Stephanie and Peter and Taylor for this opportunity and to say it's a joy to read with Joe and Tom. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Um, so I want to thank also and to thank 
uh, Stephanie and Peter and Taylor for putting this together. Uh, it's really cool to at least have this option. It's not quite the same as living a normal life, but uh, as long as this, uh, as long as we don't get to live a normal life, this is cool. It's nice to see so many familiar faces, people I met at the um, winter getaway too. Um, I also see my mom here, who's a familiar face, um, which is nice. I can trust that she will at least laugh at the things that I think are funny. Um, so I'm not going to, so I have this book called how to be safe. It's a beautiful cover. I had nothing to do with the cover. Um, I'm not going to read from this, uh, but it's still available anywhere that they sell books. Um, I gave it, I personally gave this book five stars on Amazon and Goodreads. So that's pretty good. I'm a harsh critic myself. Um, what I'm going to read, um, over the past year, or well, early last year, I gave myself a project where I was going to write a short essay for every year that I've been alive. Um, and it turned into a project I really enjoyed. Uh, now the past six months, I've been submitting these things everywhere. Um, about half of them have been published. Um, you can find them if you go to my website. You can just, if you Google me, you can find my website. Uh, I'm going to read two that aren't published. So it's entirely possible that they're not good. Uh, but here they are. Um, I thought it would, might, would make narrative sense reading-wise if I read the first and the last one. So, 1982. According to Wikipedia, the Commodore 64 was launched in the year I was born and went on to become the best-selling single computer model of all time. We wouldn't own the Commodore ourselves until four or five years later, and then it would quickly become one of the focal points of my life. I know most things on the internet are at least a little bit false, but if you've been online as long as I have, you learn how to sort through all the competing lies and assemble the world you prefer, like wild birds building their nests from gold foil and bright plastics and other especially striking bits of trash. Besides, most of the things I know about my own life are at least a little bit false. Whatever I tell you about the first six years especially can't be trusted. The Wikipedia page for 1982 also includes many details about the Falklands War, a war I am familiar with only because of the Simpsons episode, Burns' Air, in which Krusty the Clown interrupts his show with breaking news that the Falklands have been invaded. I still barely know anything about the Falklands War, except that I make it a policy to be skeptical of the guys with the biggest guns, the thickest body armor, and the most money. In most historical disputes, if you choose to believe the underdog in the fight, you're probably on the righteous side. Throughout my childhood, Imperial Western powers were fussing with the lives of people in South America and North Africa. They were deposing and installing leaders according to their idiosyncratic whims. They were brutally murdering dissidents. They were lying about it all and pretending to be liberators. I was not concerned about colonialism then. I focused mostly on consumption and excretion. You can't blame me for this. A baby's curiosity only extends so far. We're living in an era of great blowback now. The crimes of my parents' generation have resulted in the irreversible destruction of the planet a horrifying refugee crisis for which no one will take responsibility, and the return of fascism throughout the Western world. When you're a baby, you're not thinking about terrorism or rising sea levels or the destruction of coral reefs. You're thinking about your mother's face, latching onto that familiar sight that makes you smile, and as a result, makes her smile. You are a source of constant joy, except when you're not. Your mom loves you so much and you've done nothing to deserve it, and you will spend a lifetime trying to prove that you're worthy. The Falklands have been invaded. You are hungry. It's all happening at the same time. Though I did very little in 1982, it is fair to note here that one thing I did do was emerge, a living thing from my mother's womb with no disabilities or congenital deformities. I grew and learned to smile and began to crawl and ate solid foods and sprouted nubs of teeth from inside my own skull. My mom says I was a good baby. I was her second son and I learned many years later, not her second pregnancy. Women were having miscarriages all the time, but nobody talked about it. Women have to live two lives, one in public and one in private. And when they try to mix them, they find themselves in trouble with men who don't want to be bothered with any of it. There's a picture of me being held by my grandfather, the war hero, when I am less than a month old. My dad's father was already dead due to complications from alcoholism. My mom's father would be dead soon too, some kind of cancer. I was named after both of them and legally I am Walter Thomas, though they've always called me Tom, a minor discrepancy I find myself explaining to anyone who reads my name on any official form. Sometimes friendly strangers behind desks will call me Walt and I won't respond because I forget it's my name. For some reason, when I was in sixth grade, people started taunting me by chanting the name Walter and for some reason, it made me so angry. I tackled one of my best friends in the school parking lot and had every intention of smashing his face into the asphalt had I not been restrained by a teacher. The things that upset you when you're young are so stupid, but that doesn't make them any less upsetting. The 1982 edition of Best American Short Stories includes a story by James Ferry, memorably titled, 
Dancing Ducks and Talking Anus. It is the only story he ever published. The way academia worked then, he could have gotten a tenure job in an MFA program somewhere if he just published two more stories. Then he could have squatted on that job for the next 35 years, maybe evolving and experimenting in his writing and teaching, or maybe becoming a resentful power hoarding crank who never learned the names of his younger colleagues or updated his syllabus after 1991. I've been in academia for 15 years now, and now you need to have won a national award to have a chance at a better job. The tenured faculty member in the office next to mine has spoken to me exactly one time in 15 years when he barged into my office and said, hey, you work here, right? He's rude, but he is perceptive. He wanted me to agree with him that he was being unfairly accused of bullying his colleagues. I nodded and said he was right, and then he left. He's very well respected in his field, which does not give him permission to treat people like shit. That's a simple thing a lot of people don't understand. I think of James Ferry often wondering what qualifies as writing success and whether that one triumph, his, one triumph of his was worth the years of frustration, rejection, uncertainty. By almost any measure, I have had a successful run as a writer. I've gone to a prestigious grad school, published three books and dozens of stories and essays. Still, most days when I check my email, I feel a little twinge somewhere deep in my soul, worrying that today is the day they're going to cut me off. Someone is going to write and tell me that on behalf of all writers across the globe, I've been ordered to stop immediately. Time to step aside, give someone else a shot. The business is not a competition, but I forget that sometimes. I've talked about all this before in my classes and on Twitter and on my podcast and to my wife and to myself, especially. Even as I'm accumulating new stories, I'm mostly repeating the same old ones in perpetuity. This redundancy used to bother me uh, at family gatherings when older relatives relayed the same stories they've told a hundred times so we could all build to a familiar punchline and react as if it was the first time we'd ever heard it. As I get older, I'm learning to appreciate the virtue of repetition, of revising our histories and trying again to view them in a new light. Had I encountered the story of James Ferry in my mid-twenties, just after grad school, I would have traveled down to the crossroads myself and sold my soul in the spot for a story in Best American. Now all I can think about is the harsh come down from the acceptance and the blur of success, the way the rest of his life didn't measure up to what he might have expected. So one more thing I have to mention about this year. 1982 was the year my wife, Lara Beth, was born. We didn't know each other then. She was a baby too. And babies are only allowed to know the people their parents or guardians int introduce them to. We wouldn't meet each other for another 18 years, but is there any more important development in my life? Her birth is the event that shapes everything that follows. She wishes I wouldn't write about her so much in so many different venues. Surely she hates that I'm reading this, but I don't know what else to write about. This is my life. She's the reason that whatever happens in the interim, I'm doing relatively okay, which in itself is an achievement. You show up in this place one day, helpless, and for a long time you stay helpless, and the only thing you can do is find good people to lean on while you figure the rest out. So that's 1982, um, and I'm going to read 2019, which is slightly shorter than that one. Obviously, I don't have a 2021 written yet, and maybe we should just forget this whole year and try again next year. Um, 2019. Next year, my wife, Laura Beth, and I will have been a couple for half our lives. Everything I have in the world is shared with her, and every plan I make for the future is dependent on us being together and happy. I worry that writing about our future at all will jeopardize it somehow, and that if I just don't bring it up, then maybe nothing bad can happen. I don't think of myself as a superstitious person, but we all have our limits. Last summer, we finally had wheels drafted and met with a financial advisor to develop something called a life goals plan. Steve, the advisor, had a penchant for repeating, for repeating himself five or six times in a row, which reminded me of my deceased father-in-law, Fred, and was the main reason I had booked our first meeting with him. I trusted he would patiently and gently explain the vagaries of finances to us. We're both smart people, at least we think we are, but we do not understand anything about how money works, though I swear we've tried. We met with Steve several times to discuss our current savings, our aspirations, our specific financial goals, and the obstacles we might face. His office was a single, sparsely decorated unit in a nondescript complex in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, a town that, like many in South Jersey, has its charms, but is mostly numbered highways connecting strip malls. I can say that I'm from, I live in South Jersey. He's married, and I hope some days he gets to go home for lunch with his wife or that they talk on the phone or something. On the windowsill, he displayed a Rookie of the Year trophy from the Toastmasters. The thing I remember most clearly about him was that instead of saying, what ends up happening, he would say, what lands up happening. This is a phrase he, phrase he managed to use often enough that it has since infected both of our speech patterns. Steve asked us how long we expect to live so he could walk us through what would land up happening. Our options were 95 years, 93, or 91. We asked if he could plan for something closer to, say, 65, which would, have us, which would have us outliving three of our four parents. 
This was not a joke, but he laughed because people don't know how to respond when you talk about death like this. He emphasized that his job is to consider all contingencies, so by planning for the longest possible life, he can give us the best chance at success. Eventually, he ran a scenario in which Larveth lived to 93 and I lived to 91 on a line graph showing our projected earnings and expenditures over the remainder of our lives. Factoring in inflation, this program projected more than a million dollars in healthcare costs in our retirement years, a number no reasonable person can expect to be able to pay. We were presented the most, optimist, most optimistic version of our future that a computer could generate. In the year 2073, suddenly the expenses were cut in half. Tom's plan ends, an annotation said euphemistically. Larvest's plan continues. At the end of our meeting, Steve gave us a 100-page binder filled with dozens of charts and graphs, each a different permutation of our possible futures. Looking at the graphs, I try to comprehend the dire implications of every peak and valley. I understand that to nearly every being on the planet, I either don't exist, or if I do, I am just a single data point in an infinitely sprawling graph, bouncing along until the algorithm determines my value has been reduced to zero. For most of my life, I would have clung to this notion and thought it constituted a kind of wisdom, proof of the general pointlessness of existence. I would have used it as an excuse to just justify my nihilism, to shrug and laugh and pretend nothing matters. There are times when thinking like this feels like honesty, but that's a delusion that only makes you sicker. On days when I feel that familiar despair is sinking deep into my bones, the thing I try to do is turn away from the horizon and instead lower the microscope onto the smallest, least consequential aspects of my life. I push back on that voice that tells me I'm selfish for needing to look away and disengage for a minute. I try to shut out the inevitability of collapse and the crushing weight of the world's indifference and remember the individual moments I get to live. The warmth of my wife in bed next to me on a Saturday morning, the smell of her perfume on the pillow when I wake up without her, the relentless chatter of the blue jays in the trees in my backyard, a hot sandwich straight out of the toaster oven with melted cheese oozing off the edges and crusting onto the sides. My dog snoring on the couch next to me as I read a good book, or even just an okay book. The cushions vibrating just slightly with each, with each inhale. He's a pit bull mix, but when he's sleeping, he looks and sounds like the world's oldest bulldog. The sun rising over the woods, shining through the trees and into my office as I type something that feels like it has a chance to be pretty good. The freedom of a summer weekday where I'm accountable to nobody in the world except my wife and my dog, free to take a walk or watch a movie or do nothing at all. The last cool fall night when I sit on my deck with a fire crackling and a cold beer and a book I am holding but not really reading while Otis Redding plays on the speakers. The rare and perfect moments when we are all out to dinner as a family and everything clicks into place, nobody dealing with any drama or pain, nobody annoying anybody else, just a family together and laughing at the same old jokes and emptying a carafe of wine and ordering another round of appetizers and feeling invincible. I know all the ways I'm supposed to feel bad. I think about them most of the time. But for brief, fleeting moments, I forget them all, and I'm just a person who is alive and who has people who love him. That's pretty good, all things considered. I sit at my desk and I close my eyes and I breathe it all in and I try to remember. Um, I read that too because that was the least, I don't have anything uplifting, but that's the least downlifting thing that I have. So <laughs> hopefully um, that's all. If you want to read more of these essays, a lot of them are up online in various places. Um, if, if you uh, go to my website, that's all. Thank you, everybody. Well, I'd like to thank you all. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Tom. That was really wonderful. And I wonder about the rest of you. Did you feel that intimacy that I mentioned earlier? I certainly felt it again tonight. And, uh, and sort of um, something I never discovered, never thought that would be possible. So it's really, uh, really terrific. So uh, I hope that we see you next week when we hear Christine Salvatore, Robbie Clipper, and Gretna Wilkinson. And feel free to join us during the week for the write-ins. If you're not sure how to work, you're not going to break anything, you won't hurt anything. So stop in, do some writing for an hour or so, and uh, we'll, we'll be happy to see you there. All right. Um, so let me say goodbye. Good night. Thanks again to everybody who's here. Thanks again to my, my helpers and to our three readers. Stay safe. Stay socially distant, um, but still familiar with each other. And um, be safe. Oh, on the way out, uh, we'll be posting um, in, the, uh, in the chat box a link if you wanted to drop something in our tip jar. We can now keep these free programs going as long as possible. So if you feel you got a few extra bucks, we'll be happy to help take them from you. Bye now.